All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's um, course on sort of the Git skills for a maintainer that will build on the current software carpentry Git materials. So there is a bit of a prerequisite knowledge, uh, which is hopefully you know um, how to add commit, push and pull to GitHub, and we'll sort of use that as a starting ground. Um, give me one second. There we Ignore go. that, Daniel. I don't think you have are able to do what I. Um, oh, I, I just did the caption thing. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so there's a, I think like half this room right now is like facilitators, and then the other half are like people um, who are. Um, attendees. So I guess I'll start off with my introduction and then I'll skip over um, to all the other folks. Um, so my name is Daniel. I am currently a postdoc teaching fellow at the University of British Columbia. I'm also a data science educator at our studio, which just got renamed to Posit. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to sort of going over and teaching the Git skills. Um, next on my list, for participants, I have uh, Irene, and I guess you can introduce yourself if you are a maintainer for a current Carpentries lesson. Um, also mention that. Um, if not, then it's totally okay. Hi everyone, I'm Irene Ramos. I'm a new maintainer for the EF, um, Python for Ecology uh, lesson in Spanish. Uh, I'm in Mexico City, so it's a little bit late here and I might need to drop off earlier. Yes, thank, thank you for joining. Yeah, I'm on the Pacific Coast, Pacific time zone as well. So it's it will get late. Um, all right, next is Liz. Hi, everyone. Um, actually, I think I'm in a maintainer on a soon to be archived old lesson. Uh, however, my interest here is as a member of the Library Carpentry Curriculum Advisory Committee uh, and also looking to brush up my Git skills. I'm from Sydney, Australia. Um, I think that's there's there's a bit of um, background for me. All right, and then last is Noel. Hi, um, I'm Noel. Um, I'm from the University of Auckland um, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and I am a uh, carpentries instructor. Um, I'm kind of interested in, um, I guess, getting involved and in contributing to, I guess, maintaining. The Git lesson, so uh, that's why I'm um, here. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, all right, so I put in. Let me also open up this. All right, so in the now the Kodi MD, not the Etherpad. Um, I did put a link to the to the original Etherpad, and I'll copy paste everything from today over um, as soon as Etherpad starts working again. Um, this is the link to the software carpentry Git lesson. Um, treat this as a uh, foundation um, if you need something to review uh, later on. The thing that we're going to build on or try to explain is really this part of the maintainer onboarding lesson. So if you are a new, main, uh, new maintainer, uh, you may have gone through this set of curriculums where one of the lessons or one of the episodes is the infrastructure for lesson maintenance uh, episode. And here you'll see this little document or this figure about all of the components of how, how repositories are related to one another. Um, and the thing that we're really going to be focusing on is this top row up here um, where you are the maintainer. So you don't really have to worry too much about getting things completely in sync as a contributor. Although if you have questions about that, I, we might have time to answer those. Um, but we're really going to be focusing on the mechanics of how to uh, work through Git and GitHub um, for you as a maintainer. And what that all really means is you have write permission directly to the repository. Um, so the way we can do it in today's course is uh, we can sort of mimic that behavior by 
creating our own repository and being able to write to that. So you being a maintainer is essentially very similar to you working on your own private repository. And if you're going to collaborate, the way I explain collaboration is um, you can collaborate with yourself and just pretend you forgot everything your other self did. And so a lot of the mechanics will uh, be the same. Um, okay. All right, so for our first exercise to get started, uh, because we all need to get something working on our computer, uh, we'll spend about a couple of minutes, uh, just give me like a plus one in chat when you're done, um, on just the uh, this set of instructions. So we're going to go to GitHub, create a repository, I like having teaching repositories with a date in it just so like names don't clash and it's also easier to find teaching repositories if there's a date. Um, so create a repository with this date uh, with this name. Uh, pull it down to your local computer edit the readme file and if you want, you can change the title to um, the name of this skill up and then push those changes all up to github and I'll sort of do like a really small review of the basics course or the um, software carpentry Git class, and we'll also have a foundation for um, today's uh, skill up workshop. So we'll take about five minutes to get that all uh, ready, and when I see enough pluses um, in the chat, I'll just continue. Looks like Etherpad is back up.
All right, I think that's about five minutes. I've, I've looked at the wrong clock when we started, so now I'm like a little bit confused, but I'll go over the exercise. So we're going to first take, uh, go to github.com and create a repository. So we will go to github.com and we are going to create a new repository. Hi, Daniel, I just wanted to make sure, I don't think the screen is shared right now if you were intending to share. Whoa, okay, that is very true. Okay, there we go. Um, so if we go to github.com, uh, we should be able to create a, a new repository by clicking on the new button on the screen. And we're going to give it the name, um, wow. uh, give it the name of today's date and cc22-git. Uh, we're going to leave this public. You can choose to um, add a readme file here. This part didn't matter since the exercise also had you um, fill in um, some text, but we're going to just create a file um, with this right now. It is a good practice if you're working with a software project to sort of have some kind of ignore file. We're not really going to be programming uh, with anything today, so there's really not much to ignore, but I will pick a language uh, for Python, just so there's something in this particular repository. For a license file, um, also it's a good practice and all of our lessons should have a, a license file attached to it. Uh, but for this particular class, I will end up picking the Creative Commons uh, license. So when we create the repository, GitHub will do its thing, and because we already have this readme.md file, it will render the thing pretty on our uh, screen. And so next is to bring this down to our computer, so we can click on the clone button, click on one of the uh, URLs here, um, and I believe I should have SSH keys set up on my machine. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to some folder on our computer uh, personally, I think it's a good habit to have all of your Git repositories in a folder called Git, um, and then you can make your um, subfolders as needed. Um, but at the bare minimum, I still I think that having a Git repo a Git folder is a good place uh, just to store all of your version controlled uh, projects. So we're going to bring down the project by using Git clone, and then the URL that we copied. And it will bring down this particular uh, repository. And we can then CD into this repository. And one thing, if you're on a Windows machine, you'll see that the branch name already showed up. But we can also say git status. And we can see that we're on branch main. Um, there is a connection with origin main, which is the location that we cloned down from. And then everything is all nice and clean. And if we look at the contents, it will just have the license file and the readme file. And if we look at any of the hidden documents, um, there is the .git folder that stores all of the version control information and then the ignore file, which control, controls all of the files that uh, git will ignore. And so that is like the very, very literally three minute sum summary of um, the software carpentry git um, um, class. And so we'll sort of use this as, um, well, we're not done yet, actually, now that I think about it, um, but we'll use this as a, as a starting point. Um, in the software carpentry materials, we pretty much exclusively work out of the terminal, but since we uh, can sort of not do that for today's class, which is kind of a good thing, uh, I'm going to open up VS Code and sort of go through using a different text editor um, and using the Git terminal at the same time, um, since this is probably a little bit more realistic from our uh, to how we are actually going to be working in real life. So in the VS Code terminal, or if you have um, if your project is an RStudio project or something, um, you do have the option to open up a folder. And so the folder that I'm going to open up is in this Git folder, and then the folder that we have uh, cloned down. 
And so here we have this readme file on the left-hand side that represents uh, the same readme file that we cloned down from GitHub. And so the next part of the exercise was to edit the readme file such that it said this block of text or some other block of text. And, and I'll just put the etherpad link in there as well. All right, so we make some kind of edit to this file. If you are using some kind of IDE, uh, for example, VS Code, you'll see here on the left-hand side that there is like this M for this file has been modified. You also, some programs have like this uh, version control like tab where you can add or look at uh, files like straight in the um, editor. But if we were to follow the, uh, the Git materials from the software carpentry lesson, what we would do is we would type in Git status. It'll tell us we're on the main branch. And then this part has, this part is telling us what files have been modified, right? So this, the fact that this part here is showing up in red is exactly the same thing that we see here where there's this little M next to the file. So it's telling us that this file has changed. And so just to complete the cycle and review, what we can do is we can say git add readme.md. And because currently I'm on a Windows machine, it's telling us that uh, the line endings are going to be a little bit modified, but it's OK. And if we run git status again, it's going to say that, hey, um, this file is now in what's known as a staging area. So just as a smaller recap, in Git, if we have one save commit point and we want to go to another save commit point, so in the process right now is we are started with the readme file, we made some changes. The way we tell that we're going to make, the way that we tell Git that here are the files that we want to create a snapshot of is running this command called add. And it goes into what's known as a staging area. And so in the staging area right now, if we look at our terminal, this part in green tells us these are the files that are in the staging area. And so here, if we want, we can tell whatever command is written here to unstage. So sometimes you end up putting a whole bunch of files in here and you realize that you want to take it out. Depending on your version of Git, this particular verb here will be different, but essentially whatever shows up in this part of the output will tell you how to take something out. So we have the readme file in the staging area, and the way we make this actual save is using a command called commit. And so the way we can tell and create that snapshot or that commit is we can say git commit. Typically, it's really common to use the dash m flag for message so we don't have to have this random text editor show up and type a commit message that way. Um, and also, typically, commit messages are usually really short. So this is a quick, handy way to type a really quick commit message. And so right now, we're going to say, um, change title and add etherpad notes. Another thing that's, um, that you can think about incorporating into your workflow is this notion of conventional commits. And really, this is just some structure if you choose to incorporate it. Um, where is it? Hmm. This used to be on the front page. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So it's really just uh, some convention or structure to add to your commit message. So it begins with like this type and then a colon. And so you might say fix feature, breaking change, 
um, whatever makes sense to your lesson is something that you can uh, uh, do or incorporate into your um, lessons. And so one thing um, that's also pretty funny to see sometimes is like this thing called a chore, which is like not really like a big feature or a fix. It's just something that you're just doing. And so you'll see a bunch of like chores that are just happening or or documentation or styles or refactor. You can pick and choose whatever verb that you want. And really, it's just pick a cup, pick a set of words that you will put at the beginning of every commit message just to help you filter through um, your output. So we can say something like this is a docs change and then we're changing the title and adding ether patents. And now if we run get status, everything, all of our changes have been made. And what we can do is look at git log. And we can see that this is the initial commit from GitHub. And then this is the commit message from the thing that we just created. One other really useful command is running git log with the one line option. And so this gives you the one line option of the uh, git history. All right, the next step, we have this uh, commit made. There is this imaginary uh, Thing that happens. So everything on the left hand side right now is something that happens on our uh, computer. And then we want all of this information up in the cloud. Uh, typically, this is something like GitHub. Uh, Git. And so the way we communicate with GitHub is really only two commands, um, which is push and pull. And then there's some nuance into this, but for now, pushing takes something on our local computer, puts it on GitHub, pulling takes something on GitHub, syncs it back down to our local computer. And so just to round off the review, we can say git push origin, because that is one, that's what this is telling us, but origin is the default name, wherever you cloned a repository from, that will by default be given origin. So that does have some ramifications if you've um, created a fork in the GitHub or something. But as a maintainer, um, typically we just suggest open up the actual Carpentries repo and work off of that. And so you don't have to worry about juggling uh, multiple repositories or remotes. So we're going to push to origin, which is our part of uh, GitHub, and then the branch name, which is called main. And then once that's done, if we go to our GitHub page, if I can find it. Um, oops, 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 oops. If we go to our GitHub page, then everything that we just typed will be synchronized and, and on GitHub. And so this is going to be the starting point of um, the rest of today's uh, class. So what we have, or what I have planned um, is really showing you a couple of useful tricks and then really trying to cover how branches work um, in the context of dealing with pull requests and which represent um, a contributor set of changes that you would have to review. All right, so the first thing that I want to show you is we just ran this command called git log. And we added this flag called uh, one line. And that gives us the one line representation of our git history. Typically, what you're also going to want to do is there is also this flag called graph. And this is really just useful in the sense that like it'll draw out like these little dots. And as you're dealing with branches, it'll like literally draw out like the little dots and dashes to draw out the graph. And that just becomes something that's visually uh, useful. The other parameter 
is this parameter called all. You don't really see the ramifications right now, but what all will do is if you, and we will very soon, start moving from one location in our Git history to another, by default, Git only tells you or shows you where you are, which is designated by head, like where you are all the way down, like into the past, right? So there's nothing above or anything newer won't really get shown. And so using this all flag becomes useful because you get a bigger sense of actually everything that's going on. And so what I end up doing, I type this command so often, um, I actually create a, a shortcut for it. And I'll type it right now, and then I'll also uh, put it into the Code MD document. And so what we can do is we can create what's known as a Git alias, because typing this every single time kind of does get kind of does get tedious. And so what we can do is we can set a um, alias. So we can say git config dash dash global. And the way we create like a git shortcut is we write alias dot and then the name of the alias. So for me, I personally just type this command or rename this command into L for log. And then because we have a more complicated command, uh, we put into quotes the actual thing that we're going to type without the git verb in the beginning. So when I type git L, what I actually wanted to type is git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash all. And so what this allows me to do is now I can type git L or whatever I typed into this part of the um, alias command and it will spit out or run that command for us. So I'll paste that into the Zoom chat and then I will also put that Okay, so that's just being able to look at our history. And so this is really just saying like, hey, we have all of these commits that we're eventually going to deal with. We're going to end up synchronizing all of this work with GitHub. How do we know where everything is? The other thing that sort of I alluded to is this sequence of commits. We had this word called main. And this really just refers to this linear sequence of commits. Technically, the word main, um, I actually wrote that in the wrong spot. I should have written it here. And the reason why I wrote, write it, wrote it there or writing it there is main travels at, with every new commit that you make. So another way you can think about it is a commit is really another way to reference sorry a branch name is another way to reference this particular commit and so you have multiple ways of referring to this location in time you can look at the actual hash or you can look at the or you can use the actual branch name um, to refer to like this location it just so happens to be that not every commit for example this first one doesn't have a branch uh essentially name associated with it. So you can't really go to this one, um, our initial commit, without really referring, it, referring to it as uh, its hash. Okay, I think that actually is like the actual um, software carpentry uh, materials. So now what I want to do is start talking about how branches work. And the reason why branches are useful is that right now all of our lessons exist in a current state, and that state is the version that's deployed to the world. And sometimes we want to be able to make changes to the lesson. If it's a typo, it's probably not that big of a deal, but sometimes you might end up moving files around or replacing an image. Um, right now we're in the process of updating to a new lesson template. And so those are changes that you want to preview 
ideally on your own local computer before you send it off and have it deployed for everyone. And so branches allow us to work in this isolated environment without messing around with the main or uh, production deployed uh, branch. And so visually, what does this look like? So we have our linear sequence of commits uh, called main. And all a branch is doing is I will draw a kink here. All a branch is doing is still another linear sequence of commits, but it just has a different name. So I'll call this, for example, like V1. And the thing that's a little bit confusing um, is a lot of people draw it with this kink in the graph, but this representation is really the same as these three circles followed by uh, these two red circles immediately afterwards. It just so happens that main is located here and then B1 is located there. So if you're in its simplest form, if you only have one branch, it really is a linear sequence of commits just like this. And what this allows us to do is if B1 is a new feature or a new episode that you're trying to write, you can write it in isolation from the actual main branch because you might be coordinating with another maintainer um, or something and branches allow you the mechanism for someone else to review. So let's go create a branch on our uh, repository and see how we can jump around between branches. So depending on the version of Git that you have, um, so right now I am currently on 2.37. I believe the cutoff is 2.24. Um, there are some wording changes um, after 2.24, but the command that we're going to use is we're going to use a command called git switch, and we're going to give it the dash C flag to create a new branch. And we're going to give it a name called my branch. And so now if we use our alias like git L, you can see that a new branch got created called my branch head, which is the thing that our computer, like the state is in, is now on my branch. And it, before it was pointed to main, but now it is pointed to my branch. And so that's what the switch command is doing is it is the function in Git that allows us to move from one branch or switch from one branch to another. The dash C um, is really just a shortcut that you end up using a lot when you're creating a new branch, uh, because typically when you create a new branch, you also want to move to it. So this really just does two things um, at the same time for us. So right now we have this uh, branch called my branch. And if we look at our actual file, nothing actually has changed yet in the actual file. So what I can do is we can say git switch to main, and it will say like, hey, we're now on the main branch. If we look at um, our git log using the alias that we um, wrote, you can see now head is now pointed to main. And if we now look at our file, like nothing has changed. And that's because we didn't actually create a commit anywhere. So now let's see what happens if we switch back to uh, my branch. And then we go through that process uh, one more time of let's create an edit to our readme file and let's commit those changes. Right. So I'll also use this readme file as a um, set of notes for us. So the other thing that we talked about is you can potentially use Uh, conventional commits, and I'll put the link to that here. 
and then um, create the other thing that we did was create an alias for our git log all right and so this was the command every time you see me type git l um, it is running this uh, sorry this command um, on the right hand side The other thing that we talked about um, was running git switch dash c and then the name. And so this will do two things. This will one, create a branch called whatever you call name. And then two, uh, switch to that branch. All right. So if we save this file, we'll notice that VS Code is telling me, hey, this file has been modified. If we go into the uh, source control viewer, you can also see that like, hey, this file has been modified. And just like before, if we run git status, it's going to say we're on my branch because we switched to it. And it's going to tell us just like before, this is a file that has been modified. And so really the only thing that's different right now is this one word. Uh, before it said main, and now it says my branch. And so we do the same exact uh, mechanics as we did before, right? So going from one commit to another, we just so happen to be going from this black circle to like our first red circle. And just like before, the way you do that is running add and commit. So anytime you want to create a commit or like in this uh, pictorial view, a circle, you have to go through this cycle of adding and committing. And so we can do just that. We can say git add readme.md. We can look at the status. And just like before, it's telling us that this readme file is now in our staging area. And it's ready to be committed. And again, the only thing that's different is instead of the branch main, it's now saying my underscore branch. All right. So we can do git commit dash m. And then we can say, uh, Docs, I think I called it docs, right? Or doc, yeah, docs. Um, and then we talked about, what did I talk about? Um, conventional commits, aliases, and switch. Aliases and switch, right? And so now if I look at git l, or git log, dash, dash, one line, dash, dash, graph, dash, dash, all, here is this representation of what I drew before in our drawing, right? So we have our three commits and then the beginning of this other branch. And when we look at that graph view, it shows up as one linear graph, right? There isn't a kink um, that's being drawn. And so that's why um, it's important to understand that like a branch really is like a straight uh, linear sequence people draw the branches with the kink just as a visual aid. So now we can do a couple of things. This is, for example, or this can represent some kind of change that we're not totally ready for um, and we're exploring. But then maybe somebody um, says like, hey, can you double check that something in our lesson is like rendering properly or not? So you need a way to go back to the lesson that everyone else sees. And so if we look at our readme file, this contains all of the things that we just typed. What we can do is we can say git switch main. And if we look at git l, we can see that head is now on this commit. This is where I, um, this is where putting in that dash dash all becomes really handy because if I had just written one line, you can see like all of this stuff before where I currently am doesn't show up, right? And so that's why I just by habit always write dash dash all um, and then dash dash graph just gives us the little dots on the left hand side as a visual aid. So we're currently in this location in our history. And so that means if we go back to our file, it's literally in that version in uh, history. And so now we can explore, double check something, 
Um, maybe there's another change um, that needs to be made. And so this is your starting point. So you're not building on top of the same branch. Um, typically, you want each branch to be like one particular episode or one particular fix. And you don't want to and or you want to try to avoid the situation where you have one branch that contains a whole bunch of fixes and then you branch off from there. And now you have all of these branches that require some order um, of merging to happen. And so you want to avoid that. So it's also really common to go back to main to create a new branch or something. But that's really the, the useful thing about branches is this isolation of work, because now you can double check something. Maybe there's another change that needs to be made. And so this is a good starting point for things to happen. Um, one really useful command is if you're really just bouncing back and forth between two branches, what you can do is say git switch and just put in a dash. So you don't have to type in this whole branch thing. And all that will do is bring you back to the last branch. So if I say git switch dash, it'll bring me back to my branch. And I can confirm that by looking at our log and you can see it's on my branch. And then the file has changed. And that's really useful if you're just like, I don't remember what I called it because I gave it some weird like naming the branch has some weird name and I keep mistyping it or something. Um, this is another useful uh, thing where you can represent the last branch you were on by a single dash. Okay, so we have all of this stuff on our, uh, again, on the left hand side represents our local computer. How do we get this uh, branch onto GitHub? And so the way we do that, again, there's really only two commands to keep in mind, which is pushing and pulling. Uh, whoops, I type push twice, pull. Pushing and pulling. So yes, there are ways where you can merge branches on your local computer. Um, pretty much, I don't think I've ever really done that on my local computer in a really long time. And so I almost exclusively do all of my branch management um, on GitHub. And I'll show you uh, why um, in this example. So the way we work with branches is the, we have to push our branch somewhere. So the beginning of that command, that push command is exactly the same as before. The only thing that's different now is we specify instead of main, we specify my branch. And so this will do exactly the same thing as before. It'll compress, send everything off to GitHub. Um, because this is a brand GitHub, because this is the first time GitHub is seeing this branch, you also get this extra bit here that's saying, hey, your branch um, called my branch on your local computer now exists as my branch like in the remote somewhere. And so that means if we go back to GitHub, one of the things that will automatically show up is this bar that says like, hey, you just pushed up a branch. Do you want to compare and create a pull request? If for whatever reason, like I think like there's some amount of time where this no longer shows up, you can always click on this tab here that says branches, find the branch, um, find the branch that you're looking for. And then you can click on this button here that says new pull request. And then whether you use the link on the front page um, that little pop up or that button that says pull request, you'll both get to this page, which is opening a pull request. And this is uh, one of the reasons why I like using the GitHub interface or whatever system you're using, but as maintainers, we're using GitHub. Why I like using the GitHub interface for merging my branches, it's because once you are on this page that says open a pull request, one, you'll see the, uh, I believe that it's the last commit as the um, title automatically gets created for you. Um, but if we scroll down, you have some mechanism to check um, your work. So as a maintainer, you'll probably be rendering your commands locally uh, first. 
but um, this is also another way to make sure that some file um, didn't automatically get put in and you have some mechanism to review your own work. And so this is the set of changes from, um, from this entire branch. And this branch only contains one uh, commit right now. And this is that set of changes. And so once we're happy with that, uh, we can give it um, a proper title. So I'll just leave that uh, commit name as the body for now, but we can say my first uh, branch with review. So this is something that some collaborator is typically going to um, submit to your own lesson. Um, or if you notice as a maintainer, there's a change that you need to make, you probably will submit your changes as uh, a pull request as well. So once you created that pull request or somebody else has created that pull request, in the GitHub repository, you'll see that there's this tab called pull requests. And so you'll see all of those changes into um, your pull request tab. If we click on that, you'll see that I just got to the exact same page um, when I created a new pull request. And so this page, by clicking the pull request tab, is how you can do code review or really like lesson review. So as a maintainer, you have access to this green button. Uh, typically other non-maintainers, this will be grayed out for them, but as a maintainer, you'll see a green button. You'll see all of the commits um, that's happening here. If you need to talk to that person, um, you can have a discussion and say like, hey, uh, this looks great. Um, typically as a maintainer for one of the Carpentries lessons, and if you've noticed that, if you don't recognize the GitHub username, like also be, also thank them for submitting a change um, just because it is kind of demotivating if, you know, some, they submit something and there's no conversation and then just it goes away and it's kind of demotivating in that sense. But if you click on this last tab called files changed, um, if you don't want to um, bring down their code um, and run it, you can quickly glance to see like, what is the set of changes that they just made? Um, if it's like a small typo, pr most likely that's not going to like break any kind of rendering uh, thing that's going on. Um, so that's probably okay if you don't officially render it on your local computer. But um, this is where code review can happen. So you can see like as I'm hovering over, um, there's this little plus mark that happens all over here. And so you can click on individual lines and either say in uh, comments, so like, this is really cool and new. Uh, and so you can start a review or add a single comment. Or if you click and drag, you can refer to like a range of um, lines, right? And so this is really useful if you need to type the command a lot, right? So as you're reading through uh, changes, um, if it's a new episode, you can read through this for like copy edit and just say like, hey, maybe you want to reword this, maybe you want to fix that. And this is a pretty useful way to do copy editing, copy editing on your lesson. And then you can do the uh, visual and repository rendering check uh, later on. And then if you go back to the conversational view, and if I hit refresh, anything that I typed in, in the files change will also show up there. So you don't have to worry about how many files were all the changes are going to be placed, everything will be stored in the conversational view. And then once you're, um, there can be some back and forth as maintainers, have some patience, like this does take a lot of time. Sometimes, um, sometimes people will submit you changes and then they don't get back to addressing those changes for like a week later or something. So that's, um, give it some time. So again, if this is a new uh, contributor, uh, do tell them like, thank, do thank them um, for their contribution. And then after some back and forth, maybe this is your own um, set of changes, maybe it's not. Um, 
you might be ready to um, click this green button to merge. But before we do that, one thing that most people get kind of confused about is if you want to make changes to a pull request, you don't have to delete the pull request and resubmit it. The pull request itself at the very top is attached to this particular branch or whatever is listed up here. That's where the pull request is attached to. And so all you need to do is update this thing and then you can um, update this pull request. So let's say, for example, I write another message that says, um, all you need to do is update the branch and the PR will be updated too, right? So let's say I type in that note to myself and then we go through that process again, which is saying we run git status, there's a change to the readme file, we're in my branch, we're going to add that file to our staging area, we're going to write a, a commit message, it's going to say docs, and I'll write something like update branch to update PR. And so if we look at the log, like, again, nothing's really changing. Um, what you will see is the version on our local computer is ahead one commit ahead of the version on GitHub. And that's what this origin slash my branch means, or this origin bit uh, refers to the origin remote. And where does origin come from? Well, we've seen it a couple of times when we say git push origin. So this origin is that version in that account in that repository on GitHub. So we can re-push the branch so all we did on my local computer was make more changes to the branch. And when we push it back up and we refresh it, um, we'll get another commit. And you can see that the pull request itself updated. So we don't have to, what end up people doing is like they close the pull request and then they resubmit it again. And you have a bunch of duplicate stuff um, in your repository, which you don't have to do. And um, if you end up having a conversation with your, um, contributor, like you can either link them to this part of the video or um, just tell them like you can just add more stuff or add the changes to your branch and the pull request will update automatically. And then once you're ready there, all you as the maintainer needs to do is click on merge pull request, click on the green button. Um, so before we do that, you'll notice that there's like this drop down and there's like three other options. I suggest that um, you just keep it as merge the create a merge commit um, and not go through the bottom two choices unless you really know what you're doing. Um, especially this squash and merge, it is really it does make the commit messages really pretty. But if you have other collaborators and other people with other branches, like this does cause a little bit more friction um, and could be problematic, especially if you're other people in your group aren't very, very Git proficient. And so really that first option is the easiest choice for most people. So when you do click the green button, what's going to happen is now that got merged into the branch called main in GitHub. And how do I know it's called the branch in main? Well, up here, when we first created that pull request, we had one of the options of saying like, what branch you want to merge into. And so now my branch, this branch called my underscore branch is now in or combined with the main branch, but it's only on the version of GitHub, right? So it only happened um, out here. So we had like those three commits and then we actually had like those two red commits. And those two red commits now got merged in to our main branch. The thing that you want to do as a maintainer is to make sure that you're, you maintain the lesson. And so one of the things you want to do is make sure that you actually delete the branch. And that's, um, that's doing the maintenance work on the GitHub side. So one of the questions that I have is, um, 
sometimes at work you follow this process of doing squash merges and it you didn't know like it could cause problems um it's mainly it mainly can cause problems because the um it can cause problems because it's it's also pretty common that sometimes branches branch off of one another if you're not very careful when you squash uh, a branch to merge um, the branch originally that was branching off of the squash um, sometimes merge conflicts can happen or some rebasing needs to happen so typically when you do this squash merge workflow you almost end up doing like another set of steps um, and it's not always very clear like what exactly is going on unless you look through the log of uh, what's happening. So um, I do that. I do the squash merge like for my work as well. Um, but typically, and what I've seen in most like carpentry lessons, like nobody actually does that. Um, and again, it's mainly because like it kind of changes bits and pieces of the history um, in that uh, branch and sometimes people get confused where like all of this stuff disappeared. Um, but I'll talk about squashing stuff um, in a little bit because that's one of the mechanisms when you have a really complicated um, merge, uh, merge conflict happening. Uh, sometimes it is easier to um, squash everything together so you have one giant merge conflict um, happening instead of like five totally separate merge conflicts happening. So um, squashing does end up being pretty useful um, as a maintainer, especially if you don't care about like all of the like atomic commits. But um, so we've merged the branch on GitHub. And again, it's really important that you click on that delete button. Otherwise, things get super, super messy. So now the next thing that we have to do is bring all of those changes back to our computer. And so what we can do is uh, we go back to our uh, main branch. And to get those changes back down to our computer, we say git pull origin main. And what that will do is update our main branch on our local computer. There is a command called git branch a and what this will do is list all of the branches that you have on your computer. Or your local computer knows of. And so now we have to go through the process of cleaning up our branches, we have this thing called my branch and even though we deleted the branch on our remote our computers our local machine still has a reference to it. And if we look at the log what you'll see is. We had this commit, we had a branch that was created, and then that branch got merged into something called back into main. And so we still have these lingering uh, references that we should clean up. And the reason why we should clean it up is as more and more branches happen, like this really just adds visual clutter. And sometimes when things get a little bit confusing, just removing as much unnecessary clutter is can help you with fixing things. And so there's two steps that we have to do to clean up our um, repository after we do a merge. The first thing that we want to do is run git fetch dash dash prune. And what this will do is it's called prune because it's literally pruning branches off a tree. Right, so you're pruning branches. And so what this means is any branch that exists on the remote side, if it's been deleted, then the reference on your computer will also be deleted. And so if we run this, you'll see that like, oh, hey, it recognized that something got deleted. So my computer will also keep track of that reference. And so now if I look at git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash all, you can see that reference to origin my branch has been deleted. And that's slowly reducing the visual clutter of things. The last step that we need to do is run git branch dash lowercase d. Um, the lowercase d is, uh, it will delete the branch, but it won't force delete the branch. 
So um, it is the only way, the shift key is literally the only way that Git is protecting you from force deleting some bit of work. Um, so all we need to do now is say git branch dash D my underscore branch, and that will delete the reference um, to our branch locally. So if you also like made a typo or something in a branch, you can also use git branch um, dash capital D to delete it. Uh, but if you get an error when you're using lowercase D and you actually uh, want that reference deleted, then the way you fix it is use capital D. But it is uh, try lowercase D first is like if you're blindly listening to what I'm saying. And so now if we look at our history, like all the things that don't need to be there no longer are there. And we now have um, our main branch, our origin, and then this origin head is saying like, if we go to github.com into that repository, what does that show? And so sometimes what GitHub shows is also different from like whatever branch name we have. And so that's why there's another separate reference there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is we'll sort of um, go back to our um, document and you'll see that even though we're on our main branch, like now everything is up to date. So I'm going to copy and paste my notes from, from what I have. And so just as a review, um, this part isn't, we don't really need this bit, um, this extra commit, but just as another review, um, when you do clean up, at, like how do you clean up your stuff after a pull request, delete the branch on the remote, which is on GitHub, run fetch prune, and then run branch dash D. So I just made another change, uh, get to my repository. And so we're going through that cycle one more time. Um, you do have the option, I believe, to like set up a branch protection rule. So like you saw when I, I sort of dismissed it and didn't talk about it. But on GitHub, it was saying that like, hey, your main branch wasn't protected. Uh, what you can do is guard yourself from making changes directly on main. And the reason for that is this way, everything that comes in has to get reviewed, right? So for example, if I use this particular example right now, if I add readme.md and I commit and I say docs um, clean up branches after merge, all I need to do is say git push origin main. And if I go to GitHub and I go to my repository, like there was no prompt for any review process, right? And if I scroll down, like, hey, this magically appeared, right? So as maintainers, you don't have to worry about your other, you don't have to worry about um, some collaborator who's not a maintainer doing this your repository because they don't have right access to your uh, own project. But this is something that you want to be careful of if you are working with other maintainers because you can introduce something into the whole project and literally no one reviewed it. Um, and so there is a mechanism um, called branch protection rules, which maybe I'll have time to go through at the very end, but you can set that up in your own repository just so that if somebody were to type this command in this process here, you'll, they'll bounce back and say like, hey, this got rejected. And I have, um, towards the very end, when we talk about reset, um, you'll use that reset command to sort of undo and fix that problem. But right now, um, what I want to do is um, I'll sort of give people like a, to 15, like four minutes, uh, if you have any questions or like just to take a little break. Um, and then for the last 45 minutes, I want to go through uh, conflicts and then two conflict examples, uh, merge conflict examples with branches. And uh, I have like pre-made code so we can sort of copy paste a lot of that stuff. Um, and run it on our local computer so we don't have to um, spend time typing it. So I'll wait until 15 to the hour 
um, for people to sort of go get water um, and take a quick break. All right, so um, I put in the um, Cody MD doc, which will eventually be on the Etherpad, um, this big block of code. Hopefully, I'll run it first, and if it works, then it should be copy pasteable um, on your side. But I'll diagram out the setup, and then we can go through um, the code, and then I'll just run it in a block, and hopefully, it all works. So the setup right now is we have our uh, main branch. And what ends up happening is, let's say, for example, you work on something, and then also one of your collaborators work on something. And in the example from above, like we can go through this process where you uh, merge in your branches. But if there was no, so not a but, um, if there weren't any problems, like let's say, for example, you work on episode two for your uh, project and somebody else works on episode three and you are very clear that like you don't touch my episode when I'm working on it to reduce merge conflicts, then when you go through that process I just showed by clicking the green button, so when people talk about like the green button, they mean that merge button, 
then this will ha happen without any issues. But there is also a scenario where um, sometimes there is a merge conflict that happens in these branches, and it's not always apparent that that merge conflict is happening until you merge one of them in. And so the code that we're, I'm going to copy paste is going to set up this scenario right here where we have our main branch. There is a, there's two commits um, on one branch and then another two commits on a totally separate branch. And so what the code looks like is you'll see that um, we're going to be starting from the main branch. So that should definitely be the first command. We're going to go to a new branch to recreate. We're going to put some code into the readme file. Um, we're going to make a commit. We're going to put another line, make a commit, um, and then go back to main. So hopefully if I copy and paste this, this just works. So um, hopefully this even copies. Here we go. OK. That did an error, so that was good. And so if I look at git log, you'll see that we have main, and then we have two commits to the file uh, readme.md. And so if I look at this readme.md, all we did was add these two lines. Um, to our file. So we're going to go through the next bit. So it's really important that you run this switch main, because otherwise you end up having one branch on top of another, which is OK, but sort of doesn't work for this particular example that we're trying to mimic. So we're going to uh, go back to our main branch. I'm just going to type it. And then we're going to run this second bottom block of code again. So it's really the same thing, but all we're doing is changing the name um, of our branch. Okay. Um, I also like copy too much where like I also push it up to GitHub, but that's totally fine. So if we look at the output of that whole block of code, we started off from our main branch, we created changes in one branch, and then there was changes to another. So either this means that you yourself are working on two separate episodes, right? So like you're working on episode two and three by yourself, um, which is a pretty good practice to try to keep things isolated, even though it's a little bit annoying to go from one to the other. Um, but you will be very thankful uh, later on. So this can be represented by you yourself working on two separate episodes or you and somebody else, whether it's a co-maintainer or another collaborator, um, working on two separate things, All right? So on the GitHub side, what we will see, because we manually created these um, uh, pull requests, uh, we will see these two prompts, right? And we only see this because we actually created these branches. But if we go through the same process as before, and I just say create pull request, and don't click the green button for this example, like go back to the front page and then make the pull request for the other one. This view, for example, you have these two branches. So if I click on the pull request branch, this is probably something you'll see as a maintainer very often is Here's a whole list of stuff that you got to go through. And so if we open each of these, um, I'm going to open them in separate tabs. If I go to branch one, just like before, I can click on files changed and you can see changes to B1 commit one, changes to B1 commit two. Likewise, I can go to the other branch and say changes to B2 commit one and changes B2 for commit two. We can do the same code review stuff just like before. The thing that you will notice that a conflict happens when there is a change to the same file in the same location. So if I look at any of these files, like it's literally the last line of this file has commits um, going on. And that's a problem. Um, but you can see that like when we go to the main view, like it's a green button. It doesn't know that a merge conflict 
potentially can happen. And so that's one of the sort of things you want to be mindful of when you're a maintainer as you're re reviewing stuff. Also pay attention to the files that are being changed, because if you just look at like, oh, the button's green, it doesn't really like let you know that there's a merge conflict happening. Sometimes um, branches, the way they're coming in, like to avoid the conflict, like sometimes I don't, I can't replicate the example, but sometimes the ordering order of the way you're merging branches like does matter. Um, so that's another thing you want to be mindful of. So let's, I will open this up in a separate tab, pane side by side. So we have conflict branch one on the left and branch two on the right. And you'll see that if I merge in branch one, it's going to trigger branch two to have a conflict. Right, so that's one thing as a maintainer, again, you want to be mindful of like, hey, sometimes conflicts don't really show up until you start merging stuff together. So now the question is, um, how do you go about um, fixing this? As a maintainer, you should, um, if this does happen, and if you're keeping up to date with like new incoming changes, Typically, what you can do is you, as a maintainer, you tell the person who submitted this change, like, hey, um, you ask them to see if they can fix the conflicts. Um, if they can't, because they're very new to all of this, then that sort of falls on you on how you can um, go and fix that. So now the question is, how do you go and fix this conflict? Um, I believe as a maintainer, um, typically when people submit a pull request, by default, there's a checkbox that's checked off that says allow maintainers to make changes. And so that means that you as a maintainer can usually edit another person's pull request. And so you can, if it's a simple change, you can click on that little gray button and like deal with the uh, pull request, um, sorry, deal with the merge conflict issue straight in GitHub. And the way you do that is you literally look for the less, 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 equal, 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 greater, 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 and you fix this block to be whatever like the final result can be. Sometimes it's keeping one version, deleting the other version. A lot of times it's some mashup between the two versions um, that will be the final one. So your goal is to literally fix this file. So that's how you can do it on GitHub. How do you go about and fixing this um, on your local computer? So we have this state right now where we have our main branch. We had one of our branches got merged in and that is the new main. But the problem is this old branch has, is still based off of this older main commit. And so the way you fix this is you really want the branches to look something like this, where you have main, the branches that got merged in, And then you sort of want to take these commits and like start them over here. So this process of saying like, hey, let me undo these commits, um, play or fast forward to the last one and then replay every single one of those commits back. Um, that process is called rebasing. Uh, this is the way I typically teach how to fix this problem. There's multiple ways on how you can fix this problem. Um, I find this to be a little bit easier, uh, but depending on what group, and if you're working outside of the carpentries, depending on what group you're working with, you might not like this um, way of fixing this problem, but um, this ends up being like, the easier way because you have less bits and pieces to clean up afterwards. So how do we go and fix this issue? So right now on GitHub, we have this version on the left, right? And so now the trick is 
let's go and clean up everything and pretend it was like a pull request just like before in our very first example, right? So we have this pull request that was just merged in. We're going to delete this branch. We're going to go back to our local computer. And the first thing that's really useful um, is I showed you that command called fetch. Yeah, dash dash prune. What's really useful about running git fetch is let's say, um, let's look at the log of our history right now. So this is the current log on our local computer. If I just run git fetch, or with or without prune, let's just run it without prune first. What it will do is nothing on my local computer has changed. So if I look at the log again, you'll see that head is still on conflict branch two, which is exactly the same location um, that it was before. The only thing now is the version after fetch had like this other set of uh, commits going on. So before when I just ran git pull, uh, when I said like, this is the only way you can interact with this, uh, that was sort of like not totally true because when we run git pull, git pull under the hood actually runs two commands. So it actually internally runs fetch and then also merges all of the changes together. So as um, somebody who's just like, hey, my computer, like something weird is about to happen. Let me just figure out what's going on. Um, one way you can guard against just stuff changing on your computer is running git fetch first. And all it's doing is updating this history tree. So nothing on your computer has changed. And why this is useful is you can get sort of a lay of the land of everything that's going on, which is your main on your local computer is still here, but main on the remote is somewhere else. And then we have um, this branch and this branch. Um, those are all of the pieces that are going on. And so one thing we'll notice is, oh, well, main on our remote is over there, but main down is on our local computers down here. So how do we go and fix that? Well, we can say git switch main. And then when we say git pull origin main, it's doing the fetch and then also the merge. So when we look at the log, it sort of brought that back up. So it combined all of those bits and pieces. Um, so now main on our local comp computer is up to date with everything on our remote. The other thing again, is you wanna run git fetch dash dash prune just to make sure any of the visual noise is deleted. And so you can see that like that little bit um, for conflict branch one is no longer there. And if this was something that was happening not on your local computer, then this little green bit of text wouldn't even exist. And so now we're in the position of this diagram on the left, on our local computer, which is we have our new branch that's a new main branch that's all the way up here, but then we have to deal with this branch down here that has conflicts. So the way we can do that is we first go to the branch that has the problem. So which is git conflict branch underscore two. Uh, sorry, git switch. And so if I look at where I am now, now I'm down here. And the way we run the rebase command is we start on the branch that we are currently on, and then we run git rebase. And then we say, what is the branch that we want to sort of fast forward and replay our commits one at a time on top of? So how do we go from this state on the left to this state on the right? Well, first we go to the branch here and then we rebase against uh, whatever in our case main. So now we have mimicked the conflict that it happened on GitHub. So on our computer, it's trying to auto merge, it can't. Just like on GitHub, it tried to auto merge, but it couldn't. Um, let me show that. 
right? Like, so GitHub is trying to auto merge, but it can't. And then here, where it says conflict in all caps, on the right hand side, this tells you the file that has the problem. And so all we have to do is go to the file that has the problem. And then so we have it telling us like, hey, this is the set of changes um, that are conflicting. And right now it's saying that like, hey, this one commit is different from the other, right? So maybe I say, hey, I wanna keep both of them. So VS Code is nice in that it gives me little buttons um, that can that I can click, but all it's really doing is like, you literally get rid of the greater, greater, less, less, equal, equal. All right, so as soon as you're happy, again, it can be take one version, take the other version, or some combination of both. As soon as you're happy, all you need to do is follow the directions that it tells you right here. Like I never remember off the top of my head how to do this. And so all it says is resolve conflicts manually. How do we resolve conflicts? You get rid of the, the little symbols and equal sign. Add them. So I'm going to do exactly what it says, git add readme.md, and then run git rebase dash dash continue. Git rebase dash dash continue. Uh, if I spell it correctly. And it's going to say like, hey, what's, uh, what is the new commit? So it's replaying the commit. So um, you either have your computer set up for Nano, which is what the software carpentry Git lessons um, do, or if it opened up in Vim, uh, you hit escape colon WQ. But all you need to do is save and exit this file. So control O, control X. So I'm gonna say control O, control X. And it's going to uh, replay all of the commits. And if I look at the log right now, you'll see that our original, um, what GitHub thinks is the branches over here. We have the branch from main and then the two new commits that got replayed. So if I go back to my diagram, what just happened was we had the state on the left and we replayed it to the version on the right. It just so happens, um, if we look at this part, the version on GitHub is still out of date. That's what this part is telling us. And that makes sense because GitHub right now has this merge conflict, right? So G GitHub is actually out of date. So the way we fix this formally on our computer is we run git push. Um, so typically people say dash F but because we're going to be um, good uh, citizens uh, or collaborators, uh, we're gonna use a different flag, which is uh, force with lease origin, and then the name of our branch. So think of this as the same as forcing a branch push, um, but what this is doing is in the off chance that one of your collaborators is also dealing with this particular problem, if they solved it before you or had a different change before you, your changes don't just clobber on top of theirs. So this force with Lisa is saying, I'm going to force push this, but just so, just in case, if somebody else also force push something, then I'm not gonna let you do it. So it's not just gonna clobber over everything that's happening. So um, this is something that's really useful, especially if you're collaborating with multiple people, if it's just yourself, then totally just use dash F or dash dash force. That's totally okay. But uh, just know that this feature exists and uh, get to the, like get used to typing it. So if we run this, it is going to force push or force update what version is going on on GitHub. So if I look at the log right now, before where the git uh, branch two was down here, I think down here, it was somewhere. <laughs> um, oh no, it moved up. Okay, where it was like down, I can scroll up now that I talk about that. Um, where it was like down here, it has now been force moved to the version up here, right? And we see that um, because that the reference is now in line with the version on our computer. 
And now if we go to GitHub, um, it would have done its own um, circle thingy. And then it's going to tell you also there was a force push that happened. And then once we're okay with that, we can go through the process just like before and um, delete your branches and then go through the process of cleaning everything up. All right, so we merge that. We're going to, sorry, not check out switch main. And then we're going to say git pull origin main. So we're going to get those changes back to our computer. Uh, we're going to say git fetch dash dash prune to make sure all of the remote references are gone. Um, so I'm going to look at branch dash A. And then we're going to say git branch dash D. And we're going to delete um, those branches. And now if I look at the log, we have something that's all nice and clean um, and doesn't have other visual noise um, going on. OK, one last example um, to round off uh, this class. Um, we're going to go through this set of examples one more time. And what I'm going to do is show you, um, yeah, we're, it's like literally going to be like the same exact code uh, one more time. Um, and we're going to go through the first half um, again, but I want to show you another thing that's kind of useful if we have um, multiple commits um, going on. So what I'm going to do is actually um, changes to b2 commit three. We'll actually make three commits just to make the example a little bit more um, complicated. And so we're going to run this bit again because I want to show you how you can deal with like very large um, branches that have like conflicts all over the place. And if you don't care about all of the individual commits and you just want to sort of essentially like, I want this problem to go away as fast as possible. Um, this is how you can sort of deal with that. Um, so let me copy and then paste. So we're working with the same exact branch name, but again, that's okay because we've deleted and cleaned everything up. And that's another reason why I'm really like adamant about cleaning up all your branches because some off chance when you decide to use the same name, you don't end up like jumping back like 50 years ago um, to some other point in your Git history. So right now, exactly the same setup as before, um, except one of these things has an extra commit. And there's still a conflict going on in them. And so if we go to GitHub, again, we have the same exact problem as before. Um, OK, it didn't prompt me with those things, but that's OK. We can create our new pull requests. Um, usually right here, like right here, is the checkbox that says maintainers allowed to make changes. So that's where that uh, normally would exist. So I'm going to create that pull request and then go to the other branch and create that pull request. All right. And so exact same scenario as before, I'm going to merge one of these branches in, delete it, and then this branch is going to have a problem and there's a conflict. All right. So exactly the same scenario. Uh, as as before. The reason I'm showing you this is sometimes like this is three commits, right? And what if there was a conflict in every single one of these commits? And you're just like, I know that the final version is the version that I want. I don't want to step through every single one of these commits. Um, this is sort of like the trick uh, on how you can make this problem go away. Um, OK, so First things first, we do need to um, go through the process of updating all of our branches. 
right? So what is the branch that has the conflict? Branch two has the conflict. And so we need to go back and we can say, get checkout main, get pull origin main. So that will update the main branch. I'm also going to say git fetch dash dash prune just to clean everything up. And then if we look at the history, um, we're here and then we need to incorporate these three things. Right. And so one thing that can be really useful is. I just want the final state of this rebased on top. I don't want to go through the process of checking every single one. Because again, like this is three, maybe that's bearable, uh, but this could also be 20, right? And it's coming from somebody else or yourself because you're making incremental changes. Uh, maybe half of it is like typo, 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 and all of those are creating conflicts for whatever reason. So the trick that I use, the, the trick that I use is I take all of these commits here and I literally squash them down into one and then when I do the rebasing, it's just one commit. So all of the merge conflicts for all of the files all show up in one time. And I don't have to worry about, okay, it went through three of them, there's 15 more, um, how do I deal with it? So the way we deal, the way we fix that is we first go to the branch um, that we want to sort of like deal with. So we're going to conflict branch two, right? So now we're um, literally here. And if I go to our readme file, which I think is this file, um, we're, we're like in this version, which I realize is a terrible set of names, but we're like right here, <laughs> like one, two, and three. So what we are going to do is we need to tell Git, hey, we're going to do a, we're going to combine a whole bunch of changes all into one. So rebase is the actual, actually what rebase means is I'm going to change the history of for something. And so we're going to run git rebase dash I for like interactive. I think that's what it actually means. And then what we're going to do is we have to tell it like, hey, I'm going to change the history. This is the history that I'm going to change. And so we have to say like where we are. So we're going to say head. And then we're going to say from head, we're going to look at one, two, and three. So I'm going to say head tilde three. So I'm going to make a set of changes to my history from where I am. So that's head. And give me in context the last three commits from where I am. And so if I run this, it's going to open up a text editor. And what this tells us um, is these are the three commits. And if you want to change history, for example, down here, um, all of them says pick. So those are the three circles. But if you want, you can reword one of the commits. So let's say you make a typo and you're really like, you really want to make sure all your commit messages have the proper spelling. You can, you can reword them. Um, you can edit commits. So let's say you forgot a file, you can add more stuff. Usually you don't use any of this. I haven't really used any of this because I, I don't really care too much if I made a typo. But the one that we care about is squash. And what squash is doing is it's saying that I want to take my commit, but I want to join it with the previous commit. So what we can do is we can squat, uh, we literally change this file to say S or squash. You can type it out or use a single letter. And what I'm going to do is literally squash all of these commits into one. And so this is the manual way of doing that squash and merge on GitHub, but um, this is um, the squashing process. So all I need to do is, again, literally edit this file to say, I want to squash this with this and this with this. And then all of that gets joined together, right? And right here is like all of the instructions or all of the code labels that you need. So once we're happy with like this squashing um, procedure, all we need to do is save this file and exit. Don't worry about what's going on. 
but it's going to create a new commit and it's going to say like this is a combination of three commits one two and three so it's creating a new commit joining them all together all of the old commit messages are still there so you don't really lose the context of what's going on you're just losing the actual commit so you can't actually go back incrementally to what happened but all of the random stuff you typed can still be searchable um, if you need context and so all this is saying that like hey i just created a brand new commit and this is the new one and so again all you need to do is save this file and exit and so now if i look at the log what ended up happening is uh we were here um there was this conflict branch one two and three but we just joined them all together um into this one commit and you can see like the title is isn't actually correct because i didn't rename it but if i look at the file the file is correct um it is like one two and three so if i look at this what does this look like visually it's exactly the same thing as before so we have our three uh base commits we had our two that we merged in right and then we had our, uh, in our case, like three commits that were purple. All we did is we turned all of these purple commits into one giant commit. And so now when we go through the rebasing process um, here, we only have one giant merge conflict that we have to deal with. And so what does this look like? If we follow the graph, we can see that this red line started from here. So it's still off a branch. So what it really ended up doing is it really created another commit that was just this one giant uh, commit over there. And so that's how we can use the dash dash graph. Like we see this one dot, we follow the red line, the red line doesn't end until here. And then we can follow that red line and that's where it was before. And then there was another branch over here um, that moved up and there was a, I think like a, a merge that happened between this branch and main. And so that's kind of how, and I think like my font size isn't helping uh, because of this random dash here, but there was a merge that happened. And so that's why uh, drawing this out like on a piece of paper is really useful because it's also exactly what represents uh, when you run git log dash dash one line graph all. And so now we're in the same exact scenario as before, where all we need to do is say git rebase and then the branch that we want to rebase. And we still have the conflict, but if this was across multiple files or multiple things, it's all together in one place, right? We don't have to worry about okay, there's like 19 more commits, and I keep fixing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, you only need to fix this thing once, which is saying that changes to B1, commit two, commit three, it's like, let's commit, let's just keep both of them. So there's two sets of these, and that's like the set of changes that we want. If we run get status, all we need to do, just like before, is add our readme file. If we run git status, it's going to say all conflicts fixed, run continue. It's going to say like, hey, these are all the commits that were in that message. You don't really need to worry about it other than save and exit. And then now the problem has officially gone away. And then if we look at the log, um, our branch has, is, main, is now on top of the main branch. So like it sort of did the rebasing correctly. And then we say git push dash dash force with lease origin conflict branch two. And then that's how we fix that problem. And this problem will go away, right? So um, this is a pretty common thing, especially with like older repositories where there's multiple old pull requests that happen. Um, that are very big and if they sort of like you have to go fix it or the person submitting it like doesn't know what to do because this it's very daunting um, this is the way you sort of deal with it or one way you can deal with it which is I know you've been through all of these commits let's just join them all together 
and just make one giant change. Um, and then the way, and it will prompt you um, right here, like if you have multiple files, um, all of the files that were changed will be listed. And then you, all you need to do is go through the less, less, equal, equal, greater, greater, go through all of that only once because it was only one commit. And that will save you a lot of, um, that will save you a lot of like confusion with um, merge conflicts with multiple branches. Um, so again, all you need to do then is merge the branch, delete it, and just like before, go through the cleanup process. So check out main, um, fetch, prune, and then delete all of the branches that you don't need anymore. So it's branch dash D, and then I will delete that. And then now we have our um, oh, whoops, git pull origin main. There we go. Forgot to run that. Or maybe I made a typo. But now um, I, de I definitely made a typo because that's still there. Um, but now we have like all of our um, branches all cleaned up and stuff. So I'm going to actually type that correctly. Um, this nope. I don't understand how copy paste works on on Windows. I think it's enter and right click for some reason that works. Okay, there we go. So now everything's all nice and clean. And this is the state where if you're a maintainer, this is what you want to see. Um, one last thing um, that is really useful again is let's say for example you write um hold on give me one second um all right all right so i mentioned before like there's a reset command on let's say what happens if you accidentally have a branch that um, like your main branch is locked and you can't, and you accidentally make a commit on it, All right? So let's go back to our, our readme file and let's talk about, we talked about um, git rebase, rebase dash i, that was the command and then head tilde something, I'll just say five, um, interactive, Base, which is useful for large merge conflicts. All right, that was the main takeaway uh, build up around using rebase. So let's say I made a change to this file. And again, we can say git add readme.md and then git commit and we say doc uh, docs uh, rebase dash i. And then we realize that, oh no, we made a change to main and main is locked and we can't actually make this submission. The way you get around it is it's a two-step process. First, you leave a breadcrumb where you are. So the way we do that is we can say git branch and then we can say rebase i. And all this will do is wherever we are, it creates a branch where that is. And so this was different from running git switch dash C, right? Because git switch ran git branch and then also switched to it. Most of the time, that's the thing that you want. But if all you need is like, hey, I just need a breadcrumb or a marker exactly where I am, but don't change where my branch is. Um, all you need to run is the regular git branch command and it will do that. Uh, and you can see head is still pointed to main um, even after we ran that command. And so the way we fix this problem is what is, so it's really common uh, when your thought process is, I don't care what's on my computer. I don't know why Git is giving me all of these errors. I just want to go to like this location and just bring all of my files, ignore anything that happens, just bring me there. And if that is the feeling that you have, then the first thing that you run 
The first command that you run is git log dash dash one line dash dash all. Uh, oops, one line, right? So you first run this command. Um, I've been using the shorthanded version, but you run this command and you find the hash, whoops. You find the hash of the version that you just don't care and you want to go to. So for me, it's going to be AE35A58, and it's going to be different for everyone else. And all you need to run is git reset dash dash hard. So first thing, again, before we do this, you want to make sure that you're on the branch that you want to like just reset and pick yourself up and go to. So first, make sure you're on the right in the right place. So I'm in main, and that's what I want. That's where I want to be. I run git reset dash dash hard. And then the commit message that we are going to say, I don't care what happens, just bring me there. And then um, I'll use the, the little more compact version. Um, and then it brings us there. It didn't ask us any questions, any changes to your files all got thrown away. Sometimes that's just what you need. Uh, and the reason why this is useful is your main is now in sync with the remote main, and then you can check out this branch and then do the whole adding, pushing, pulling, create a pull request review. So if there's a, if you ever end up having that feeling of like, stop asking me questions, Git, just go there. Um, your this is like your magic command, um, and that's how you use it. Again, you do have to be careful. If there's stuff that you actually care about, uh, make a commit for it before you decide to like just upend and just go somewhere else. Um, but that's how you sort of fix that problem. Um, but yeah, we have like two minutes left. So I'll sort of open this up for questions. And um, one of the questions was, how do you propose lesson changes? As a maintainer, you should have the authority to make changes that you seem fit. You do have the authority to do that. If it's like a really big change, um, that's where the uh, curriculum advisory board comes into play, where um, if it's like a very large change, like you're trying to rewrite half your uh, lesson, um, that's when you need a little bit more input to make sure that's okay. But if it's like, hey, I just want to make sure that like, you know, you following, make sure everything follows some kind of style guide, or there's like tweaks here and there, um, that is all okay. You don't have to ask for permission for those things. Yes, we have a couple of minutes, one. <laughs> um, but if anyone has questions, um, I will try my best to answer them. Otherwise, that is probably like the core, the rebasing and the resetting is probably like the most common things that people get stuck on uh, when I was helping other maintainers the last two years. Thanks, Daniel. I just wanted to say um, this was really great and I really liked how you went through the um, your illustrations um, and got through rebasing because I've looked at rebasing and gone, ah, oh, people make jokes about that in on Twitter and they shudder. So <laughs> I'm staying away from it. Thank you. Yeah, it's rebasing is, again, it's one way you can fix a lot of the conflict problems. The, the other way is cherry picking. And depending on the group that you're working with, um, rebasing technically changes the history. So you're like, you could lose context of like why this thing, where this thing even sprouted from. Um, and cherry picking is making copies of all of the commits. So there, there's two, again, there's two ways of solving the same problem. I don't use cherry picking because it creates another branch and you have to now deal with deleting two branches instead of just dealing with the one. But um, that is just another technique um, that you'll see other people um, use. Um, um, yeah, I just also want to thank you. It was really useful to learn all of this, uh, especially as a new maintainer. It was overwhelming, but um, I can see why it isn't covering the maintainer onboarding lesson, but it's great. So uh, is this written up like somewhere? Yes, I'm hoping that the fact that this is recorded, it'll be on YouTube somewhere. 
And part of like doing this part of carpentry, uh, like at home, uh, carpentry con is like, so this ends up recorded for like the next round of maintainer onboarding. Well, thank you. Okay, um, so with that, I guess, I don't know, uh, David, do you have any closing remarks that you need? Otherwise, uh, thank you for, for coming, everyone. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I hope this is helping you be uh, a more successful maintainer. Uh, yeah, there wasn't anything provided as far as requirements for closing remarks, but I just want to say thank you for sharing your expertise and thank everyone for coming because I definitely found it enlightening. All right, so I'll clean up some of the stuff, um, the code EMD document, I'll move things over at the etherpad. And then um, if there's any like missing notes and stuff, I'll just update it in the actual readme so it's there as like reference material, because uh, I stopped editing the readme file for examples. Um, so I'll try to get all of that a little bit cleaned up and stuff as well. All right, with that, um, thank you. <laughs>